Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, the Miranda Ensemble is very excited to be here and to perform tonight. Thanks again to uh, Jesse and to Michael Reese and to all of ICDA for bringing us down here. Uh, we're, we're thrilled to be here. For me personally, this is a great joy to be able to stand up here because it has been a long time a fantasy of mine to be able to have a bunch of colleagues of mine as a captive audience and to complain about all the things that bother me about the world of choral music, actually. So that's what I'm going to do. So when it comes to choral music, I am an incorrigible cynic and pessimist. This isn't because I lack affection for choral music, but rather just the opposite. Because it is just about the most important thing in the world to me, and because I'm deeply unsatisfied with the status quo, I am a cynic because I find that position much more useful for combating the problems that we face. When I asked a lot of my choral musician friends, what would you most like to hear discuss in a conference for, for choral musicians and such, the answers were almost totally uniform. Vowels, programming, and so on and so forth with that, with that tone of voice and with the shrug of the shoulders. And I've always wondered why. Why the unrelenting emphasis on practical matters in choral music? Uh, now, in a way, it's understandable. Choral music today is uh, mostly known through education and teachers have a difficult and oftentimes thankless job that they're really interested in tips probably to make it easier for themselves uh, and less than just generally less miserable and that's completely understandable but what about the state of choral music today what about aesthetics why do we even do what we do as choral musicians and just what kind of thing is choral music in the year 2014 anyway these are questions we need to answer in order to justify our existence even for choral music educators, the job is not simply to make Susie a competent musician capable of ta-taing and do-re-miing with the best of them. Great music is useless in the economic sense. It does not exist to make you look cool or famous, uh, and it doesn't exist to make you money or sell a product. The goal of music making is primarily not one of competence, but of soul cultivation, the goal of all art. The improvement of your inner life. The only way we can really stress this is through philosophy, and especially the philosophy of art, which is called aesthetics. So let us then begin by even asking, what does it mean to have ideas about choral music at all? Most choral musicians I've met rarely talk about our craft as a cultural phenomenon, and that's understandable. After all, you'd be hard pressed to find an art form that has less cultural capital than choral music. It does no, us no harm to admit this fact, that in the face of Miley Cyrus and whoever else, very few people not involved with the craft rarely think of choral music. It could be that it is just a great art form that few people happen to appreciate in our age of short attention spans and viral videos, no matter what we do. And if that were the whole story, I'd be fine with it. I have no problem with choral music dying by murder. If people as a whole simply aren't interested, it's all the worse for them and for the culture. But again, the primary aim of art is not to be cultural propaganda, it's to be food for your soul. So choral music might die of murder someday, and I've made peace with that. But what we should never make peace with is death by suicide. And I'm convinced that that is exactly what's going to happen unless we change things. That is the purpose of my talk, to make the case that if classical or choral music disappears from this earth, it will not be because Joe Schmo would rather listen to Britney Spears and that's that. It will be because we sacrifice what little cultural influence we have on so many contemporary altars. The altar of the market, which says that popular music is not substantially different from classical music, the altar of multiculturalism and political correctness, which declares that any aesthetic judgment in favor of Western art music to be based on racism and colonialism. And lastly, on the altar of popularity. So desperate are we to contend for influence that we're willing to dilute the things that make us great in a pathetic gamble to get people to like us in what we do. It won't work. People in search, hey, thank you, hello. This is very awkward, I'm so sorry. No, that's just fine, I just. How's everyone doing? <laughs> I'll just be your mic, mic. Yeah. Oh, I know, it's lame, I'm sorry. Right. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, 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 hello. Test, 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 test. Good? Okay. Okay, so in short, uh, doing things to make us more popular will not work. People in search of something authentic can smell that fear from a mile away. What intelligent people actually want is real music that aspires to things higher than fashion and pop. And I assert this with all confidence as an aesthete with a deep and abiding interest in all the arts. Intelligent art lovers are generally not interested in choral music. 
and maybe with good reason. If you think this is a lamentable state of affairs, then going along with the flow is not an option. Again, our enemy here is anti-intellectualism and anti-aestheticism among choral musicians. If I can convince you of one thing today, I'll have succeeded if I can convince you of that. We cannot be passive subjects in our culture. We need to insist on our cultural influence, but we can't do that if we continue to passively accept so many sacred cows that have harmed our art. So I'm going to rail against the things that I think have harmed us and continue to harm us. Because these are complex social and cultural phenomena, I'm afraid I must often refer to the nomenclature of philosophy and cultural studies, which is unavoidable. However, I will try to define all my terms so that if you're not huge into aesthetics and cultural studies, you'll still hopefully get something out of what I say and take a gander at that handout that I printed out for some definitions. If precedent is any guide when discussing these topics, there is no doubt that some of you will get offended. Many choral musicians have dined out for decades on the kind of problems that I'm going to rail against, but I'll also suggest some practical me measures for resistance for those of you who can be swayed by my propaganda. Either way, I hope that I'll even convince those of you who might react instinctually against what I'm saying that choral music is a cultural phenomenon that cannot be approached naively. When you participate in it, you become an actor in a much larger phenomenon that carries its own set of assumptions, repressed ideas, and explicit creeds. Not examining those qualities means you're a passive subject, and that's what we need to avoid in this field. In fact, I think it's a certain fact that choral music has put up with more crap than maybe any other art form precisely because of these evasions. So before we get to what choral music is like today, we need to take stock of where we came from. In modern times, basically since the Industrial Revolution, if not before, individual subjective life, and by subjective life I mean the life of the subject, the individual, in the West has been defined primarily by anxiety and alienation. No longer can we rely on state, church, or another institution to help us define ourselves. Identity creation is, was not, is now entirely up to us. Today, this anxiety has reached a fevered pitch. It is one of the only difficulties we as relatively rich difficulties we as relatively rich and prosperous Americans have, but psychologically and spiritually, it is a doozy. Recognizing this fact is absolutely central to understanding the kinds of art we're surrounded with today, but more on this later. This modern condition, articulated so well by Freud, Marx, Ayn Rand, and others, was not always the case. Before the emphasis on the self that has come to define Western civilization, man belonged to a community whose bonds were strong. In the Dark Ages, life was brutal, short, and unremittingly cruel, but alienation was not the all-pervasive state of the social landscape like it is today. Individual choice and freedom was tyrannically suppressed. People were brutalized and tortured for all sorts of reasons, but man didn't have to worry about inventing and promoting himself. Culturally and politically, the space of his social and spiritual life was static. There were peasants, serfs, feudal lords, kings, and clerics, and what you were born into was pretty much what you were going to be. Indeed, it was even thought that no substantial progress in human affairs would be possible until the second coming of Christ. So everyone had a place in the Dark Ages, even if all of them were a place that no one in their right mind would want to be. But we'd be lying to ourselves if we said this kind of world has no appeal for modern man. Here I would like to ask, how many of you like Game of Thrones? My husband knows. OK. I also love Game of Thrones. But I think it's actually a very modern fantasy in many ways that is, taps into what I'm talking about here. There's a lot of appeal to the sort of highly formalized life where everyone sort of has a place or whatever. And of course, in our fantasies, we all think we'd be the knight or the king or the princess or whatever. Uh, but I think that's a fantasy that they really tap into there. And what makes it a modern fantasy, I think, is that they take values that we have today and just impose them yeah. on like a, an ancient setting. Like, for instance, with their sexual mores and stuff like that, rampant hedonists. Every hero in the story is a rampant hedonist having sex with whoever they want to, eating whatever they want to, fighting whoever they want to, sort of things like that. So we take, it's like we want that old world without like any of the bad stuff, which is like <laughs> oppression by church and state and so on and so forth. Anyway, music of the Dark Ages, which stands rightly so as the beginning of our Western music, reflected philosophy of the age. It was strictly a community activity and reflected the two community re realities, the folk and the church. It's true that there were some creative musicians of prominence, troubadours and such, but they were also servants who reflected the narrow realities of the community, in this case, the world of chivalry and courtly love. There was no emphasis on the creative potential of individuals in the musical sense. Nevertheless, the seeds were there for a renaissance. Gregorian chant treated development in the same way that all primitive or relatively primitive peoples do, strictly horizontally. But nevertheless, sophistica sophistication became apparent as time went on, as musicians focused in on the special functions of tones in the scale, 
and an increased knowledge of intervals as expressive tools became prominent. The intellectual class of the day, namely monks and nuns, revived an interest in classical civilization, and this led to the Renaissance, that great rebirth of classical ideals and art to which we owe so much. The combination of individualism, the individualism of Christianity with the belief in truth and beauty in the classical sense was an enormously powerful cultural force. Within this framework, individuals still had a solid, mostly predetermined place within their community, but we also see respect for the individual like we did not see in the Middle Ages. The artist was viewed as a special person who had insight, a person of cultural prominence. Think here, especially of uh, the Divine Comedy. This is the whole theme of the Divine Comedy with Dante is how the artist now has a special relationship even with the divine that requires no intermediary. Uh, at the same time, artists were still accountable to the community for their creations in that their works were supposed to express the classical ideas of truth and beauty, basically the beginnings of what we would call a common practice period. The artistic fruits of this syncretism were and still are astounding and represent one of the greatest achievements of humanity. Renaissance polyphony, both secular and sacred, became an homage to unity and diversity. As time passed into the late Renaissance, we see the beginnings of what would give Western art music the pride of place that it has in human affairs up to our present day. The deep level, harmonic and melodic development, not only horizontal, but vertical and multidimensional. So that so would come to dominate the Baroque, classical, and romantic musics, arguably reaching its apotheosis in the sonata form of Beethoven. The ideas of human dignity and reason, meanwhile, reached their fullest expression in the philosophy and times of the Enlightenment, a couple centuries later. In philosophy, Immanuel Kant argued that human values and dignity were universal and laid down the most substantive philosophy of the modern era, so much so that modern philosophy is now defined by whether a philosopher was pre-Kantian or post-Kantian, much like we think of Greek philosophy as either being uh, pre-Socratic or post-Socratic. Uh, in politics, the Founding Fathers created the freest nation by far in the whole of human history, and we bear the rewards of material prosperity and respect for the individual as Americans today. In art, the Enlightenment applies its ideals of human dignity and reason, and the focus could now turn to the struggle of the individual in ways it could not before. Now looking back, however, we can start to see cracks in the facade. The totalizing philosophy of the Enlightenment was simply not able to cover some of the darker areas of human experience. As such, by the time the 19th century came around, artists were beginning to be concerned with this gap. Poetry, painting, and music tried to recover the sense of the sublime, the natural, even the primitive. Something, according to romantic artists, had been lost. A sense of community and belonging that had been replaced by the anxiety of self-creation. Romantic artists wanted to recover through their work that which had disappeared. Richard Wagner came to epitomize this struggle, and indeed he formed our modern age perhaps more than any other composer, I claim. Uh, Wagner knew that things had changed, and he wanted to reclaim a shared part of humanity that existed in medieval times. For his material, he turned to Norse myths and gave them his own special interpretation in his operas. The gods are dead, he seemed to say, and now it's up to us. Wagner even tried to create a new type of audience, one that would attend his festivals at Bayreuth and help propagate his Gesamtkunstwerk, or total artwork philosophy comprising drama, music, and dance. But the wheels were in motion already and the 20th century loomed large. Now in the early part of the 20th century, artists had to confront what they saw as the total domination of kitsch. Theodore Adorno, the great cultural critic of the age, defined kitsch as roughly beauty without the ugly part. What he means to say here is cheap, sentimental, Hallmark card type beauty. Real beauty has a challenge to it, a strangeness, as Sir Francis Bacon said. It isn't to be found in surface level trifles. But Adorno and his peers thought that tonal music had been so compromised by kitsch that artists needed to move away entirely from tonality. Nothing more was to be said at the tonal language of the past except kitsch, so the argument goes. As such, Adorno railed against kitsch in art music, railed against pop and jazz music, and embraced atonality and serialism. Other artists followed suit. In painting, for instance, we have uh, you know, nothing new can be done with representation, hence we have modern abstract art. Uh, yet this, not, this, this attempt was not an, an attempt to destroy high art, but to preserve it by erecting barriers around it to protect it from the vulgarities of the market and kitsch. This movement is what we now call modernism. And now we get closer to our current dilemma. Despite modernist attempts to save high art, or as I argue perhaps because of those attempts, the power of kitsch, the market, and pop grew in popularity over the decades <laughs> more than Adorno or Schoenberg or anyone else could have imagined. Accelerated by the never-ending revolutionary power of capitalism, ever new desires were catered to increasingly short attention spans. 
Though modernism succeeded in walling itself off, that was, in the final analysis, about all it, su it succeeded at. As such, it became easy to parody, which brings us to postmodernism. Though, as with all aesthetic and cultural movements, the start is difficult to identify, the cultural revolution of the 60s had a solidifying effect in, on ideas that had been present in the cultural world since the end of World War II. Uh, those ideas rejected modernism in favor of any number of alternatives. Dadaism, for instance, rejected the battle for coherence in art at all. Uh, but mostly, artists were sick of avoiding kitsch in the market. They grew up on television and popular music, why fight it when most people, including themselves, just associated those things mostly with fun and enjoyment? This coincided nicely with the Cultural Revolution of the 60s. Whatever cultural, common cultural language people had was called into question by hippies and their allies. Why, they asked, even promote some kinds of art over others? Why promote culture at all, seeing as it has dirty hands from complicity in racism and colonialism and other such isms? Artists coming of age in this time grew up totally under the influence of the market and its ally, Kitsch. Though definitely aware of modernism, modernism and its aims, they found pop irresistible. Andy Warhol had his pop artworks displayed in prominent museums, and now Campbell's soup cans were displayed next to Rembrandt. An interesting thing about Andy Warhol is almost unbelievable to us today. He has so you know, these soup cans, Marilyn Monroe portraits, and, and so on and so forth. He actually did not approach these things ironically. According to him, this is pre-irony. He actually just liked them, and he just put them together, and then he, he wasn't making a comment about art, which is really weird to us today. If somebody does something shocking, we think, oh, it's a commentary on so, so and so, or whatever. But no, not for Andy Warhol. He, it's pre-irony. Um, other artists, emboldened by this new culture of aesthetic relativism, rejected the battle between modernism and pop kitsch altogether and tried to take art and music to strange new places. Out of this climate came the poster boy for artsy music as we know it today, John Cage. Mm -hmm. As musicians, I have no doubt that all of you are at least a little familiar with his exploits. What you may not be aware of is how much his shadow looms large over so any so-called art music of today. I went to grad school for composition, and I can tell you very much that it is an axiom of studying composition today that you must reckon with what John Cage did and his accomplishments and so on and so forth. Um, Cage was obsessed with questions that a precocious child of 10 probably could have answered, but were considered deep because of the bizarre intellectual atmosphere of the 60s. For instance, why do we consider music to be comprised of tones? Maybe it's everything, and so on. Uh, this is a question that has been fairly, fairly settled for centuries, if not longer. Uh, but Cage and his allies still consider that to be some kind of damning critique of, of Western music. Consider a recent Cage biography by Kyle Gann, who's a, a scholar at Yale, in which he describes Cage, Cage's famous four minutes and 33 seconds, which I trust you're all familiar with. Total silence, four minutes and 33 seconds. It's a score, it is still a score, it says that, it says roll a piano on stage, sit down, and sit there for four minutes and 33 seconds. So Kyle Gann, at any rate, says it is an act of framing, of enclosing environmental and unintended sounds in a moment of attention, in order to open the mind to the fact that all sounds are music. So let's take a listen, if we can get this mic now for working here. Now this is, this is actually my computer, so you guys will be able to see all my bookmarks and such, but don't judge me. It should, it should be ready to go, Michael. Is it? Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing uh, the, my, my, I have like a YouTube example up right now. That's, that, that's my desktop for sure, but. Yeah. You have to. Oh, okay. You have to mirror the. Uh, I'm glad you're here. But <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of this at school. You have to mirror the display. Oh, Scott, of course, right? <laughs> no, 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 of course. It's the anti penultimate. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So okay, cool. That's cool. All right. Okay, so here's John Cage. This is from a television show. The audience laughs a lot, which. We shouldn't be surprised at. <laughs> anyway, he takes a very seriously professor in his school at this time. Because um. these songs are in no sense accidental. Uh, in the, if you like it, you may buy. Here we go.
along here. We did get started a bit late, so I do also want to say that uh, if we have time for Q&A, that would be wonderful afterwards, but if, if we don't have time, which we likely won't, uh, we're back here at 3.30, and we'll, we'll continue then. We're just talking about the Miranda Ensemble on our special approach. But anyway, so John Cage, fundamental intellectual inquiry was, and in my experience still is, not welcome in this kind of postmodern world. Something as basic as, well, if all sounds are music, why do we have two different concepts for music and sounds? If we can't distinguish between the two, why would we even be able to form two different concepts? That sort of thing is not answered. I was actually reading this book on aesthetics, which I think I recommend in the reading list there, Roger Scruton's uh, music, uh, Aesthetics Music. And um, somebody was, it's, there's like a postmodernist who was reading it before me, and they put humorous notes, at least humorous for me, in the margins and stuff like that. And they call, they call him a, they, she's insulting Roger Scruton, who's a great aesthetician in my mind. She calls him just a debater because he asks questions like these. As though, I mean, I think that's very typical of the kind of, just don't, you're not supposed to ask any questions for this kind of thing to work. But at any rate, um, such line of questions are, are, demit, are, such lines of questioning are demit, dismissed in the grand tradition of postmodernism, rejecting what they call meta narratives, which is a term co uh, coined by the postmodernist philosophers, really the two uh, uh, philosophical fathers of it, uh, Lyotard and Baudrillard. Postmodernists tell us that no system of truth should be privileged over another for any reason. And this includes everything, of course, in relation to music. What then are the artistic values of postmodernism? Novelty, shock, everything in quotation marks, meta commentary, and irony, to name just a few. A famous example from 1987, actually, the photographer and artist Andre Serrano, Piss Christ. Are you familiar with this, this work? It is a work of uh, a crucifix submerged in the artist's urine. Big deal, actually. Uh, he, people still talk about it today. He got $15,000 $15, from the National Endowment for the Arts for this work. Uh, it won many awards. It's still displayed everywhere. So no more complaining about funding, you guys. You know what you, you, know what you have to do. Um, so yes, anyway. Uh, I mean, no one, no one outside the artist establishment likes that kind of crap, so almost all of these famous works are, get some kind of, um, it's, it's just an interesting fact that what people think of as like rebellious works of art are actually pretty much exclusively state funded. It's very interesting. Um, the resistance to meta narratives promoted to this very day by just about everyone in some form has made artistic discrimination an unwelcome process, especially if said discrimination might be seen to adversely affect some marginalized group. Even if you have some, uh, someone well-read and articulated enough to actually discuss the aesthetic merits of various works, the culture is now so firmly against discrimination of any kind that there is almost a taboo against it. And here I mean artistic discrimination, of course, merely telling one thing from another, literal discrimination. But non-judgmentalism is just one head of the postmodern hydra that needs to be lopped off, I claim. Another head has done just as much damage to art in our new century, and I refer here to pluralism. The belief that a sheer variety of artworks, regardless of aesthetic quality, should be promoted. Uh, this is such a prevalent feature of our artistic landscape that I designate our cult current artistic landscape as postmodern pluralism, which I think I define on your sheet, but I'll repeat it here because it's important. I define it as the aesthetics of progressive political ideals combined with the market logic of late capitalism, i.e. globalism and multiculturalism, the fundamental premise of which is the dismantling of previously so-called hegemonic artistic traditions in favor of a plurality of artworks, regardless of any particular notion of aesthetic quality. What does this mean concretely? It means that where in the past the range of acceptable music for use in churches, education in the concert hall was, we're told, lamentably narrow. Now with our modern ideals, we can teach and perform Mozart and Lady Gaga, folk, music with, with Bach, rap, and Wagner, all expressions of basically the same thing. The previous historical approach to art was too and music was too narrow, we're told. We need to open it up and even get rid of the notion of art music and basically try to make it all the same thing, 
or at least all the same thing aesthetically. This really is the position of postmodernism, I'm not making this up, and it is the dominant philosophical school of art education today, I claim. Uh, aesthetic and cultural judgments will need to be exposed, we're told, as mere tenuous speculation at best and tyrannical, hegemonic expressions of racism and power at worst. We're told that the notion that one kind of music is superior for aesthetic purposes is wrong. And all of this is not mere philosophical speculation. It actually shows in the music, even and especially in choral music. Let's take a look at some examples. Back in 2013, for the first time that I can ever remember such being the case, choral music was in the national and even worldwide news. Why? Because a composer of choral music won a Pulitzer for, for her composition. And I'm referring, of course, to Caroline Shaw and her piece Partita for Eight Voices. Um, again, this is pretty much as much attention culturally as choral music may ever receive, right? Uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you have heard this piece? Okay, so let's take a listen. To the side, to the side, to the side, around, through the middle, to the side, to the side, to the side, around, through the middle, to the side, to the side, to the side, to the side, and around, and around, and around, and around the middle, to the side, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, through the midpoint, of the light drop, and around, 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 and around,
Uh, the composer Liza Lim is one such modernist example. In a review from the April issue of The New Yorker, music critic, critic Alex Ross, who's probably the most prominent uh, uh, like choral and classical critic in the world. How many of you read, have read his book, The Rest is Noise? Yeah, so very, very, very popular fellow. Uh, informs us tellingly that Lim's music shows an acute sensitivity to the local and the particular. He says that one is tempted to call one of her pieces a masterpiece, except the word is far too egotistical for an artist so keen on collaboration and so attuned to the experiences of others. It's a peculiar feature of our current ideological age, I argue, that people, I, I see this all the time on Facebook or whatever, but also in reference to things like this, there's just a general paranoia that like, uh, re regarding some phenomenon that's really anecdotal. Like, oh, <laughs> composers in the past, we all have traumatic memories from, from composers who insisted on their place in the culture and really wrote music that was, you know, a big score and stuff like that, and a big deal, and it insisted on their place in the culture. I mean, who, I've, I've been around since, you know, at, since the 80s in, in terms of existence, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, in the classical, music world for you know 15 years now at least I've never once heard of anything like this of the comp oh he's just like an, a new Wagner demanding his play in music be shown respect and has culture series. it never happens but in every piece of criticism that we read here serious criticism there's always the same kind of praise for composers who don't do that like oh they they don't want to be known they don't want to do anything and I think that's just too suspicious that's what the system wants cultural passivity um, so anyway, uh, that piece that Alex Ross called a masterpiece of Liza Lim's, let's take a listen. This is a masterpiece, remember? This is from the premiere, live performance. These musicians are live, <coughs> these are, are, are professional musicians in Holland. It's, it's not a joke in any way. <laughs> consider pointing out modernism's aesthetic flaws to sort of be belaboring the point here, but let's do it anyway for fun. Modernism's attempt to put high culture behind a wall was maybe a noble one, but a dangerous folly. In the final analysis, they didn't so much protect high art as abandon it altogether. In the face of modernist music's unrepentant ugliness, people rightly reasoned that high culture was too much work, or they didn't get it. So they took what was on offer and said, instead and thus postmodernism was born. Modernism thought that the option was between high culture and kitsch, but they were wrong. Intelligent listeners could, for instance, turn to jazz, which is by far more appealing and sophisticated than other 20th century art music of this sort. Or they could just wait some decades for intelligent indie pop, and that would probably have given uh, an intellectual art lover their fix. Uh, I assert that both modernist and postmodernist music attempted to deal with musical problems through non-musical means. For the modernists, kitsch was the problem. Their solution was not to find a musical response to kitsch as much it was as it was to utterly renounce it at all costs. As the excellent aesthetician and philosopher Roger Scruton points out, it seems as though their new compositional grammar did not, and still has not, ever match any, listening, any known listening grammar. This is important, because today we hear all these things, including in articles by Alex Ross all the time, that audiences need to catch up with composers, because it's our fault that we were just like not, we haven't attuned our thinking to stuff like this, apparently. Postmodernism has the same claim. Lovers of John Cage and the like assert that conservative audiences need to abandon what they think of as music because all sound is music, and so on and so forth. Uh, like modernists, their attempt to deal with musical problems is met with philosophy, not music, to the point where apparently all we need to do is change our thinking and appreciate this new and exciting stuff, and so on. 
Uh, again, if you think this is all just mere theory and has little to do with music itself, I assure you that these ideas do not exist in a vacuum. They are now the status quo, the system, and the market, whose vulgarities in past centuries were kept in check by powerful cultural institutions, loves every bit of it. The irony is that, as I mentioned before, postmodern ideas and the popular ideas of the 60s were once actually viewed as a legitimate rebellion, which is hard to believe now that those ideas are the powerful voice of the system. Everything from bottled water, Starbucks, uh, the cult of exercise, yoga, health, the mainstream obsession with sex, all of these things are, were once considered actually rebellious cultural features that are now totally like the norm. Um, so it's, 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 just, it's an ironic sort of situation. For instance, also conceptual and abstract art were once thought of naively as like a real rebellion against the system, which was oh, so representational, sick of painting portraits, and so on and so forth. But observe, observe now, where do you see the most abstract art or conceptual art installations? Corporate lobbies, essentially. This is an art that anyone can appropriate. It's easily symbolized. They can, it, it, when you see it in a corporate office, you're like, yeah, that, that makes sense. It's like a modern, cool place or whatever. Not would be possible with Rembrandt. You could never, they would never have a Rembrandt in the lobby. It can't be symbolized in that way. And so, speaking of the corporate stuff, everyone in the singing world is familiar with Glee. I'm afraid, I hope I won't offend any of you too much here. <laughs> Anecdotally, it is commonly known that the show is credited for saving or energizing a great number of school music programs, a phenomenon called by teachers the Glee effect. Does that, have you guys heard that? Does that make sense? Yeah. No, no, never heard it? Okay. Anyway, I, the teachers I talk to mostly confirm all this stuff. Um, according to a poll done by the National Association for Music Education in 2010, 43% of choral music teachers credited the show with a surge of interest in their programs, and that was in 2010. Uh, I, my understanding is Glee is still continuing. They've got some new season coming out or whatever, somehow. It's in its last season? Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, but what about the show itself? So first off, let's note that the show isn't about art music or choral music per se. It has no pretensions in that, in that direction. But that makes sense from a market point of view because as I've said before, uh, great and true art is impossible for the system to make cool. Uh, the kids in Glee could not, there's no way they could sell that as like Bach and Mozart is awesome. This is not, it, in the same way that uh, the corporate lobby can't put up a Rembrandt or a Vermeer or something like that. It just, it doesn't fit because it can't easily be made to fit into someone's program. Um, so it's no, it should become as no surprise to us that Glee is, is about pop music or, or whatever. Um, so how does Glee sell its message to adults and teenagers alike? Like every piece of commercial propaganda today, the show attempts to push the idea that identity creation is the driver of subjective meaning. So let's take a gander at the audition scene from the pilot. I hopefully, I, I think I put that in the definition thing of the, of the system perhaps, uh, but I'll, I'll come back to it. Couple minutes, okay. Sorry to say, I have a really damning critique of this of this kind of thing. Agree. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so. First of all, I think it's really humorous that I love watching the show because, of course, the idea here they get to rehearsal soon afterwards. This is the pilot, and the director's like, "Oh, you guys suck. We're not right for anything." And it's like, 
any choir director's dream in terms of talent and stuff yeah. like that. But that, of course, that, that has to work with that. Yeah. It's part of the, the, the shtick or whatever. Anyway, make no mistake, what we see here is everyone in their supposedly proper place. The message is through pop music, we can all find our personal identities. So we have the black girl singing Aretha, the gay kid singing in falsetto. I assume he's gay. I've only watched so far. But I mean, I think it's, anyway. Uh, the lesbian girl, well, again, I don't know if she's really lesbian, but she's portrayed as such here. Uh, it's, it sings, you know, about kissing girls in a contralto voice and so on and so forth. Uh, so a couple scenes later, we see the uptight A personality girl singing Les Mis and acting like a diva. And since earlier in the episode, we already saw a kid in the wheelchair singing, Sit down, you're rocking the boat. He doesn't need to audition, apparently, or we don't need to see it. <laughs> Speaking of that kid in the wheelchair, don't be confused by the fact that the show seemingly makes light of people's identities while also affirming that to deny those identities is the worst sin that person could commit. As the philosopher Slavoj Žižek points out, highly recommended, anything he's ever written, I have it uh, on the reading list there, irony and mockery do not destroy our current cultural system they actually managed to strengthen it. It was long ago thought that if there was an idea in the culture or a figure, a person of authority, for instance, that if you were to mock them, that that would actually like reduce their status. It's not the case today. We live in a very bizarre world. I, as I was talking to the ensemble the other day, they had this thing on the internet, Britney Spears uh, had like a, her, it was a real take of her singing yeah. a song, did you see this? Yeah. And of course, it's, it's awful. Yeah. But, I think everyone today knows that in terms of celebrities, no one's bringing any great talents to the table. Yeah. No one, but no one cares either. And it's just, it's just as popular. Irony and mockery do not destroy the system. They strengthen it. This is very weird, and it's essential for understanding the kind of culture that we're a part of today. Uh, so it isn't a contradiction when a show for preaching tolerance also has no less than three wheelchair gags in the first episode, or features a black girl saying, oh no, you didn't and other such cliches. The message to everyone, but especially to susceptible teenagers is, your identities consist of what signs and symbols you send to other by being yourself, and you be yourself through the approved channels of pop music and other types of branding. Add to this the promise of enjoyment, especially sexual enjoyment, and you have as powerful an advertisement today as you could ever have. Someone please ask me in the Q&A about how Glee is about sexual enjoyment. I'll go on and on and on and on. And on. <laughs> as I have hinted before, there is an alliance between all the artsy stuff I've talked about and the world of Glee. They should not be viewed separately. They are rather part and parcel. The goal of this unholy union between art and market is to turn us all into a demographic that can be marketed to. Under the guise of false tolerance, we will be told not to ignore our differences and view ourselves as universal subjects, but rather our differences must be acknowledged at every single moment because to deny them is to really hurt somebody's feelings because you're not honoring who they are. Uh, this is a really big thing in choral music, I, I, I claim. Uh, in choral music, this usually translates to the patronizing effects of multiculturalism oftentimes. The folk music of non-Western cultures is arranged in a kitschy, quasi-Western manner, depriving it of its natural setting and power and presented as ascetic equals to the masterworks of the West. The spiritual, a great American folk tradition, needs lip service paid to it apparently at every mixtape style choral concert, usually is the patronizing final piece in the program. If you don't believe me that it's patronizing, how many uh, choral music concerts of just gospel music have you ever seen? Probably not many. If you're like me, I go to tons. It's always at the end. Um, if, it's, if, it's that, if it's that great of a thing, why not just do it? It's patronizing. It's, it's a token thing to send people away with, ooh, the happy, the serious stuff's early in the concert, but the happy stuff's at the end and everyone can go home and smile or whatever. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, out and out arrangements of pop music are becoming very common as choir and orchestras suffer from Me Tooism and try to court the guy on the street. It won't work. Pop culture can smell fear a mile away and pop, pop culture can do pop music better than classical <laughs> and choral musicians ever could. Understand me, I do not regard folk music as in any relevant way inferior, but I do insist on aesthetically distinguishing it from art music. Folk music retains its utmost dignity when experienced as a phenomenon of the folk, as an anonymous musical expression of the community. Art music, on the other hand, does not exist to slavishly serve the extremely local or the particular. It is neither an expression of the people, nor is it a way for somebody to vulgarly express themselves. It's an abstraction of the soul. The only requirement for entry is that you're a human being. Its subject is the Ding An Zi, 
the thing in itself, pure ideaness, musical beauty. Music is about itself, which is to say its subject is existence formalized through tonal relationships. Postmodernism and modernism oftentimes make appearances during choral music concerts of every kind, but while just about every choral musician I've ever met pays vigorous lip service to both, choral music has mounted in its own way a kind of resistance. Though both deserve to fall under the banner of Western art music, choral and instrumental music are different in some respects and oftentimes are more able to play to their great strengths <coughs> when left to their own devices. Since singing has been a human activity since time immemorial, choral music has always had an element of the community to it. The unique and mysterious relationship between singing and text gives us, as choral musicians, a special status. We can harness the abstract power of tones uh, and musical structure while simultaneously singing words together. It is a moving experience that is not easily parted with for the sake of being fashionable. Sorry, I think we're kind of running out of time here. I, I have a lot more. Um, in, uh, we're going to be back here at 3.30. Can, if, if you guys can come back, I can just continue. And I don't have much more, and then we'll talk about the Miranda Ensemble and let you go with it or something, I don't know. So if, if you can come back at 3.30, that'd be great. I'll continue onwards. I, I have to conclude yet, and I have many more points to <laughs> iron things together. But anyway, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Postmodernism and modernism oftentimes make appearances these days during choral music concerts of every kind. But while just about every choral musician I've ever met pays vigorous lip service to both, choral music has in its own way mounted a kind of resistance and it has a different artistic space um, in that it's opted, I'll argue, for a lower status, actually. Uh, though both choral and instrumental music uh, deserve to fall under the banner of Western art music, they're both different in some respects and are sometimes able to display their great strengths when left to their own devices. Since singing has been a human activity since time immemorial, choral music has always had an element of the community to it. The unique and mysterious relationship between singing and text gives us, as choral musicians, a special status. We can harness the abstract power of tones and musical structure while simultaneously singing words together. It's a moving experience that is not easily parted with for the sake of being artistically fashionable. Um, and to pause here in the reading list as well, Victor Zucker Candle, a great aesthetician, is at his best, I believe I say that there, when in his volume two of the two volumes I said there, Man the Musician, Man the Musician, he has a great section on the relationship between text and tones, and excellent fodder there for the choral musician to really get to the heart of that relationship, which is a great aesthetical mystery. What exactly is the relationship between text and tones? Victor Supercandle, I think, is one of the best at um, coming up with a very compelling and persuasive argument there. Anyway, as such, the modernist aesthetic never really penetrated the choral world as deeply as it did the instrumental world. Perhaps sensing that it couldn't compete, choral music abdicated its cultural position and retreat, retreated to mere community chorus status. Hence the situation we have today, especially in this country, almost no one outside the field regards choral music as high art, but choruses are ubiquitous. Due to the difficulty of getting people excited about funding choral music as high art, there's little incentive for professional singers to seek a vocation in the field as professional singers. Um, as such, choral music has to a large extent embraced the age-old enemies of art, kitsch, sentimentality, and cliché. What I've come to call, somewhat affectionately, neo-Protestant kitsch, dominates <laughs> popular new choral music today. You could pretty much call out a popular, popular contemporary composer by name, and he'd fit the bill, I, I think. Uh, this music is so saccharine sweet that if ears had teeth, we'd all be brushing by intermission. Aesthetically, this music is defined by thick, harmonic textures that somehow manage to be harmonically dull, having more in common with pop music chord progressions than anything else. The rhythm is atrophied, perhaps, because, perhaps prompted by the misguided notion that total quarter note domination will enable the listener to better appreciate cutesy little color notes. As a result, intelligent art lovers have rightly decided that contemporary choral music is of little interest. I consider that to be an obvious fact in my involvement in, in the other arts and such like that. If, unless you're a singer, or you really like singing in college, you, people just as intellectual art lovers, I think, just have no interest in contemporary choral music. Um, and as I argued earlier, I think with probably good cause, unfortunately. 
Uh, so I've complained long and hard about a lot of the things that bother me about the world of choral music. As I said at the beginning, I'm a cynic in regard to our profession, but I think it is a warranted cynicism. But I'm not so cynical as to think there's nothing that can be done to resist this sad state of affairs. So if you agree with me, here are a few steps you can take to resist and refuse. First, to the best of your ability, discriminate and judge works of art. Do not ever promote ascetic relativism in word or deed. Works of art are different from each other in important qualitative respects. They're not just different, but of equal quality as a rule. In fact, that's, not, that's the anti-rule. They are different in every respect, including quality. Second, reestablish the field of choral music as a struggle to represent truth and beauty. So basically, the pre-20th century view here. Uh, it's not a game for the purpose of reinforcing and confirming people's identities. It is pri not primarily a means of expressing oneself, it is a means of soul cultivation. And remember what I said uh, earlier about Gui as it's promoting this very postmodern idea in the art world that the driver of subjective meaning is identity creation. This is the idea of Gui that we saw during the audition scene. That's a really bad idea. Two, it's, it's not something human beings are designed for psychologically to have to reinvent ourselves all the time, which is why today we get the, why I say it's on crack today, or cocaine or whatever, you, whatever drug that makes you crazy that you want to use. Uh, we're always having to do this, and so there's just paranoia that we're not like always acknowledging each other's differences and such like that. And I think that's, that's bad for anything, but it's especially bad for art, where discrimination and judgment are crucial to uh, artistic integrity and to its surviving as a, a viable means of, or viable human endeavor. Third step you can take, study aesthetics. This is important. Even if you disagree with everything I've said, choral musicians of all kinds need to be more fluent in the intellectual language of art. And to this end, I put that list on the handout to get you started. Um, aesthetics, outside of some philosophers I've known, I, I very rarely met art musicians who, who read on these topics or are at all interested in them, and I don't think that's good. It's not just choral musicians either, it's classical musicians of every kind, and I think that's, that's lamentable. Because um, again, it's, it suggests to me some kind of passivity that you're just going along playing and singing with what's happening or whatever, and we need to actually insist on a positive direction for the culture for, for our art. Um, fourth, and this might get me into some trouble, unreservedly champion past composers as superior to today's, because they basically are. Um, now, he'll need a aesthetics and philosophy to do this articulately, but if you're in a pinch, you can just do what they do to us, and you can say, oh, I just thought it was obvious that these guys were superior to, to composers today. Um, because of course, as I was, went over earlier, uh, just in the, in the art and composition world, which I am pretty intimately familiar with, you know, the big argument is, you know, you just don't understand. It's obvious you haven't caught up to modernism and these great, you know, abstract, crazy things or whatever. Um, so if you get into a pinch, you know, before you really feel articulate enough to argue against somebody, you can just say, oh, I just thought it was obvious that these guys were better. I guess we'll just have to disagree or, you know, whatever. Do that. That'll, that'll, work, in a, that'll work in a pinch. Um, and then fifth, if necessary, as it almost surely will be, you're going to have to be unafraid to embrace like an, an elitist title. Like people will say, no, he's an elitist. This will especially come if the people critiquing you think that they're coming from like the pop music uh, world, basically. Um, they say, no, but we just like classical music. Well, what an elitist. Whatever. And you should say, damn right. I am an elitist. If, if necessary, in my experience, arguing against being an elitist is fruitless, a fruitless activity. They'll never be convinced, so just embrace it. Um, six, and this is really the most important of all. If you are wielding power in the choral or art world, never program anything but for aesthetic reasons. Never, only for aesthetic reasons should you ever feature any kind of art. Notice I'm not here, I'm not even gonna ask you to promote even the aesthetic that I'm promoting here. Just pick something and treat your mission as like an aesthetical one, rather than like, oh, but we need to represent X, Y, and Z, and we need to do it for these reasons or whatever. No, 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 just treat yourselves as artists and the people you're in charge of 
as artists, and you should advocate for doing things for artistic reasons only. That's why we do what we do. This is not, it's not anthropology, we're not a museum, we're not here to preserve something that we think is important for non-artistic reasons. We're here to promote art and to engage in art. So only program things for aesthetic reasons. Um, look, and again, even if, if you're as aesthetic as Britney Spears and only Britney Spears, do that and commit to it and say this is important for human beings and we should, we should listen to this to make our lives better or whatever. You'd have a really hard case. But I, this is why I think you'd be better if you took if you, if you took my arguments to heart and championed uh, unreservedly the, the, the works of past composers. Aesthetics is only a necessary line of inquiry when we need to answer the question of why we so find something beautiful or when we need to justify some kind of art. The everyday person on the street, from my experience, does not consider the musical world as an area in which he is required to do philosophical battle. The fact is that as human beings listening to music, we have little need to qualitatively differentiate the kinds of music music that we hear explicitly. If someone that likes a certain kind of music and enjoys listening to it, they don't have to justify it to others, and that's a fact. They don't owe us anything, especially as artists, because we've abandoned them, and now the market's just filled the void that we've left open. Um, so while that may be an acceptable attitude for us as listeners of music, right, there's something very compelling about just merely enjoying what you're listening to, regardless of aesthetic con considerations. We are still artists, and if we embrace that vocation, we can't treat ourselves as mere consumers. We have to actually take things to a, 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 be a better place for the culture. Um, the man on the street, who has you know, greater concerns, doesn't have to defend his love of creed or wh whomever or prompt it. Um, that's banned, right? Okay, okay, I threw that in there, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, when he hears the type of music that so-called intellectuals are promoting today, he doesn't have to answer them. Uh, he feels like he doesn't have to answer them, and he definitely doesn't. Music is not primarily an intellectual puzzle to be solved, but a gift from the gods to enrich our lives. But when the battle enters the realm of judgment, when one kind of thing has to be privileged over another, as in a concert, for instance, we must rely on aesthetics to justify the great art music of mankind. My plea to you and to everyone else is to stop squandering mankind's choral inheritance. Unfortunately, we're in more trouble as a culture than any notion of aesthetics can fix. As much as I detest postmodernism's effect on choral music, the reality of our situation is sort of articulated correctly. How can we really believe in anything anymore, let alone the kind of music that is more artistically important than another? Because keep in mind, of course, postmodernism's core principle here is anti-meta-narratives. We're always now, today, when thinking about the truth, always double, doubling back on ourselves and saying, well, but wait, maybe to someone else it's different, or you know, something like that. Uh, it, it's a sad state of affairs. Um, I don't see any other option but to go, to, just to say, we don't accept that anymore. We know that truth is involved here in some way, because even that truth is stated as a truth. Even the truth that you can't, so we know that truth has some privileged status, and that's what we need to tap into, as David Foster Wallace says, in a single entendre way, without the doubling back that's necessary for being like an intelligent person today should embrace things and defend them. Um, and it's a tough question, though, because we know we can't just go back to the way things were centuries ago either. This is a question that we need to grapple with, but just because there's a struggle there yet to be had doesn't mean that we can't at least begin the struggle. We know where to begin because we can refer, refer to powerful musical experiences in the Western canon of art music before the 20th century and some during. We know that even music today is based on and indebted to this music however far away it wants to claim to be or whatever. In fact, without the cultural space created by Western civilization, the openness that we have today wouldn't be possible, seeing as how it has no precedent in human history. The first step here is admitting that the grand ma masters of Western art music were really, really on something. They were really, really right about some artistic something that refers to music. We don't need to have a full and comprehensive aesthetic defense of Western music to be able to say that. And in fact, we can go a step further. They were more right about music as art, as art, than anyone has been so far, from any culture and time and place, and especially from our own. Our job is to promote that great music above commercials, kitsch, and the odiousness of postmodern art. That's simple, and it's something we can all do right away. It's also revolutionary, even though it's just a step towards a conservative choral aesthetic. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> The Miranda Ensemble, of course, I, I formed, um, I mean, 
I'm a singer as well, and 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 uh, and we're all singers, and you know that's our our job is primarily to do what we do well, and uh, promote the highest quality of, of choral music in general. That being said, though, I have obviously a lot of problems with things in the choral music world, and so I formed the Moran Ensemble in part to do things like this, like actually promote an aesthetic in addition to performing the music that we think is great. So. Uh, that's that's a little bit about about starting the Mirandola Ensemble, and I got and I named it after Pico della Mirandola, who was a great philosopher of the Renaissance, arguably the father of the Renaissance. Uh, he wrote a work called the uh, Dignity, or Oration on the Dignity of Man, which is basically the foundational text for Renaissance thinking and philosophy. Um, and I think his approach actually is a very modern one, and is one that would help, that could help us, potentially, um, and, and help intellectuals in general do the thing I was talking about, which is actually stand for something, rather than, oh, well, let's just go with the flow, or just, you know, everything's, everything's great, or whatever. Um, so that's a little bit about, about the Miranda Law Ensemble. Um, no, one, no one has any comments or questions. Yes. I was counting. Yeah, I was counting. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, all my three pieces. Okay. And so when I put on a concert, it's supposed to be fluffy and light. And yeah. And uh, the audience, they're, they're to the point now, I think it's part of the culture, they all just sit and talk to each other. In the audience? And, yep, and listen to the kids kind of when they feel like it. And, uh, and the kids on stage as well are getting the feeling that, you know, if we do something spectacular or if we misbehave, that that's a good thing. Yeah. Because then they'll be on the world's funniest video. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so here you are trying to, you know, do music. Yeah. Well. And I, I, I'm just saying that's the way I see it. And sure. And I think it's part of the culture. I don't. Yeah. I, mean, I think it's part of exactly what you're talking about. I, I think so, certainly, too. Um, you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's a bizarre fact, sort of, of choral music, because no other art is like this, in that people mostly engage with choral music in an educational setting. It used to be the church also as well, but it's, it's, that sort of ceased to be the case long ago. Uh, so it's, it's an odd thing that mostly, like, for, lo for those of us who not only have any connection to education or whatever, and are just, uh, just sing around, basically, um, most of, of what we do is directed in a way by education. It's not the other way around. Usually, usually education follows like the art as it is in the culture in general. Um, but choral music I mean, just depends so much on, on, on music teachers and on choral music uh, teachers um, to, to promote it. So, but you know, it's, it's kind of an unfair arrangement for everybody because people whose job it is to teach young minds now are sort of saddled with the burden of like, well, we also have to like protect this, this art form. Um, and, and then, and then it, it, outside of the educational world, the only concern should really just be aesthetics. And it's not, because people come from educational systems uh, like we do, and especially if you're a director in the non-educational setting, people do what they did in the educational world. Um, so it's, it's an unfortunate state of affairs. The only way out of it would be really for there to be a surge of interest artistically and, 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 and with, you know, with the general population in choral music as some kind of high art, which is what, what I try to promote. Um, but you know, that's a, that would be a huge thing. And so, don't hold your breath. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a very interesting arrangement there. Um, and like I said, I mean, I, uh, this is kind of a popular sentiment that I've heard from some, some major conductors. Um, choral music in the church is this, the other thing. I had a section in here about that. Um, you know, it used to be, a, obviously, that's where people could pretty reliably hear great music for a, for a very long time. Um, and then, and then it, uh, I mean, like sort of American sort of Protestant traditions with uh, leaning as they kind of do sometimes on like prosperity gospel type stuff was never really in a great position to defend great art or whatever and that's fine the only problem is you know the Roman Catholic Church for instance that was a, they profited greatly from the alliance between art and, and, and liturgy basically 
And in, in the name of uh, popularity, they got rid of that in basically the 60s. And today, church music is so kitschy. It's just unbelievable. It's 95% kitsch. So most people, when they encounter choral music, if it's not in an educational setting, it's in church where they hear 95% kitsch. And that coupled with just the kind of general idea that, well, uh, volunteer singing, all singing is pleasing to God regardless of the quality. I'm sorry, it's really ruined choral music for a lot of people. And that's gonna be that's gonna be felt for generations to come, really. Like, even when I was a kid and I heard stuff like that in church, I thought, this is massively horrible. And I I was in a position to enjoy it. I loved even classical music at that time. You know, it's not like I had no interest in it. Um, but it just the the quality wasn't there and and the, the music was just so unrepentantly kitschy and if, if choral music is 50% kitsch in like a professional concert setting today, church music is 95% kitsch. It doesn't matter what church. Um, so that's, that's a real, that's a blow. You know, there could at least be another cultural institution there besides education that, that was able to like have some influence, but it, it doesn't anymore. Um, so that's, that's another thing. <laughs> I think I, yeah, you had a question. Yeah. yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious. Um, you focus a lot on like how important you think the Western canon is. Yeah. So like, I'm. I guess I'm curious. Like I'm the West. Like I. I, I agree with you. I think that the Western canon is absolutely fabulous. And mm -hmm. you talked a lot about how you talked uh, a little bit about how um, like uh, ending a concert with a spiritual is like an is like an appropriation. Patronizing. Patronizing. Yes, yeah. that's the two is the word I use. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and you talked a little bit about that, and uh, and you talked about the merit of like folk music as uh, as a function of the people itself. The folk, yeah. So, like, I'm curious to think like there has to be some like I feel like there has to be some value to the non-Western system. No question. There's tons of value. But what like what's your what's your opinion on that? Well, the, my opinion is that choral music is generally not really equipped to handle such things for a variety of reasons. For one thing, the choir, as we are familiar with it today, is a Western invention. There's no question about that. There's no, there's no, you know, we've never discovered another culture that has SATV or, you know, different voice parts singing together in harmony or whatever. Um, it's, it's so, to say, well, this is part of our, this is what we should be, we should be doing. That, in addition to the fact that, like I said, I think folk music is something that uh, shouldn't be li limited to like a professional artistic class in any way. Folk music is for everybody, and it's an ex it's a really it's a really localized expression, localized musical expression that affirms community values and identity. Basically, it's not to say that we, I mean I I love a great deal of folk music. Um, I just think it's different in a way, and. And I, I, I want to distinguish from it aesthetically, but I just don't think that choral musicians attempting to integrate that into what we do is going to be profitable for anyone. Like I said, also with arrangements of folk music, which really that's what we're doing, right? This stuff's not, if it's written down in other cultures, um, it's, it's their memory aids and it's not literal notation. That literal notation is another um, Western invention. So, in order, to, what does it even mean for us to do folk music? Uh, well, we get it in the form, it's notated by somebody, and it's arranged for the people that we're going to have singing it. So already, I think you lose some of the fire there, you lose some of the intensity. That, and that raises the question, then, of, well, how are we supposed to enjoy this music if it's not supposed to be choirs or whatever? Well, you know what? We just might be in a lot of trouble there. Like, I, I don't think, I think you might just have to find it somehow and not have to rely on, I don't think it's like so d desperately important that, oh, but what if this, they have a great tune or something like that and we don't get to hear it? Well, I think it's much more important to pre preserve the aesthetic integrity of both the folk tradition and of art music. Um, so it's, it's a complicated question and it's also exacerbated by the fact that today, there's kind of an emergency situation going on with, with say, choral music, which I, th I think a lot of people are, are um, attracted to the idea of it being some kind of anthropological exercise. Like, we should, it's our duty to promote this kind of music because no one's gonna hear it anywhere else and they can't get it anywhere and so on and so forth. Um, and there's, there's some truth to that, you know? Um, 
but even so, I think it should still be regarded as, as an emergency situation. They're like, there is it's a real possibility, uh, given given the market and such, and the way uh, the system works today, that stuff is just going to disappear. Um, and that's that's truly, truly unfortunate. Uh, but I don't propose. I, that's not my field. I don't know how I would go about preserving such things. I just really am skeptical that kitschy Western arrangements of folk music is going to be able to bring much of an aesthetic value, especially in line of what the this five centuries of great Western music that is really something we can aesthetically deliver on. We can just deliver on our aesthetic promise there. Um, so I don't know. Did I, did I cover that kind of? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's basically my guess. Yes. But that would also draw a line through wonderful arrangements. I mean, yeah. if you're if you're con if you're contending that we should um, treasure the, the composers of the past, then the melody of the past should also be routinely treasured. So yeah. you have uh, people like Vaughn Williams collecting folk songs for Sheet Radio or something. And then, and those songs being brought in in artistic ways. Oh, no doubt. And Robert Shaw, et cetera. So that line between folk music, art music, is, it's not a clear line. No and question. I, I just kind of, where, where would course. you be drawing the line and what would, why would you take all that out? Yeah, uh, well, I would take out the things that you mentioned, though, <laughs> because um, there is such a thing, of course, of course, as you mentioned, the English composers or somebody like who's really famous for you know, like Bartok, for instance. Um, that was though their, their use of folk material was an artistic treatment of it in terms of like high art. It wasn't their idea was not we have to preserve this and, and repeat it or something like that or treat it as though um, that this you know has has a lot of community meaning for the folk <coughs> wherever we're going to perform. They, their idea was this is this is material, great tunes and such like that. But I mean, I I think where you draw the line is well, they just took it straight up to art. Um, so that's that's very different from general aesthetic relativism that we hear today of well, it's folk and you know like basically it treats Western art music, for instance, as just another brand of folk music, essentially just kind of an intellectually, you know, I don't know what you'd say uh, how you parody it, but. Um, so, just because that there's a spectrum there doesn't justify relativism. In other words, there's still an aesthetic difference between the two. We still have two concepts between art music and folk music, and we should still be able to distinguish between those two things. And my argument with against the folk music again is largely kind of a practical one, and I'm just not. I don't. Choral music isn't designed. As an, as an art that's alive to be like a museum where we like, well, there, it might disappear so we have to preserve it. No other art feels, feels um, that compulsion to really do that, not even instrumental music because there's, they have a history of dealing with sort of more abstract works and stuff like that, and of course, choral music to instrumental music is a real arrangement, like that's not even like, or folk music to instrumental music is a real arrangement. Um, and so, it's a, it's a burden that's placed on choral music that's been that's really almost taken over the field in in my view because of aesthetic relativism because of the idea of well now let's get rid, rid of these meta narratives no system of truth should be should be uh, promoted above another so it's all if we can sing it let's do it basically um, and all the better that it's from that's from a culture that's that's not our own or whatever and uh, I I don't think I don't think that aesthetically we're able to deliver upon that promise. It's, it's, it's just, it's almost too much. Folk music groups that are out there, I think could be, would be a better alternative to the local choir or whatever, who can, who can really focus on five centuries. I mean, really, tons of music. It's not, it's not like I'm saying, no, let's, let's just go after this little bit of choral music. I mean, this is five centuries worth of music. This is tens of thousands of, of pieces of individual, discrete music, you know, and, um, yeah, so I, I think that I, mainly I'm arguing for let's distinguish, let's judge between these two things, and, and all across the board, let's, let's actually judge in terms of, in terms of uh, aesthetically within even art music and then aesthetically within folk music. A hard thing about judgment in folk music, this is an issue in, in aesthetics that's a, a pretty big one. I think it put on the reading list Leonard Meyer, where a book called Emotion and Meaning in Music. 
And the problem with folk music is that oftentimes, if you're going to say somebody like to somebody like me who is greatly inclined to Western music, Western art music especially, and I've, I've, I'm really intimately familiar with the best arguments for why that's, that it, it's, it's the, uh, uh, the artistic tradition of music. Um, when, we, when we say to somebody who is a, a big uh, Im- lover of folk music and such like that, um, or when they, when, they, when they try to present it as on equal aesthetic grounds, or whatever, in terms of even art, um, they present two kind of contradictory views. One is that if you if you kind of like examine it, the other is like no, you, but you can't understand it. You're not from you're not from that culture or whatever. And the other one is you can understand it, but you just aren't judging the right qualities or whatever. And, and I oftentimes want to be like, well, well, what is it? You know, I think choral music is a different musical phenomenon. Um, it's definitely on a spectrum with art music for sure. Um, and when it goes from folk to art, it's almost always because an individual said, "Here's let's treat this material in a certain way and bring it up there. Um, so, I don't know if that answers your question. I, I can go on and on. It clarifies. Okay, good, good. <laughs> well, I just, I, I kind of want to push back a little bit on yeah. the church music thing. Because yeah. although uh, the, most of the work that I do is um, collegiate choral work, mm-hmm. um, I have always maintained on the side of that a church position because I say the church job kind of keeps me a little more real. Yes. The school is kind of academic and it's easy. Mm-hmm. I can agree with everything you say and I can sell a college choir and all that. Yeah. You know, it's 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 not a, it's not even a hard sell. Yeah. It's, it's a harder sell in the church. Mm-hmm. But in my lifetime, I heard that western art music in the church would be gone by the time I was this age. And it's just simply not true. Yeah. Because a few of us have pushed back and have done exactly what you've said. We do too, we all and sing I, in it. I, and, yeah. and you know, in, in Des Moines, Iowa, there still is Coral Haven song that happens. Yeah. And and I have managed to um, attract younger people to yeah. that. And young people sit for my Vidor postlude last, I played the Vidor second uh, last Sunday and 400 people in the church sat there and listened to the end of it. Yeah. And they're not necessarily, they're not our, you know, so I think it's our responsibility to push Absolutely. back that's in, in a respective way. But um, th- that's why it's, it's it feels good to hear you say because our culture says that it's all equal yeah. and right. the praise band service and Mozart's Ave Verum. Oh, you just like one over the other. That's right. No, one of them is actually crap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm in full agreement with you. I'm in full agreement with you, and you know. And I think the church. I think while the church has relinquished its responsibility, I think there are enough people that uh, have stepped up and will continue to step up that the church, in some ways, could own a role in this in the future. That'd be great, and you know, there there may be um, there may be signs that things are changing in this regard. Uh, you know, I think I think a lot of especially clergy people that I've talked to have thought actually maybe this direction that the church went in the last fifty years actually draw people away. We, again, you know, it's, it's oftentimes, I think the whole, um, you know, liturgy as entertainment sort of thing has actually, uh, is, an, is analogous to the situation we oftentimes face in classical music, whereas you have, I'm sorry, my beloved Minnesota Orchestra. You know, every other concert these days is, well, it's, oh, it's Ben Folds with the orchestra. Oh, it's so-and-so with the orchestra. And the thing is, they think that's actually going to get fans to classical music somehow. I mean, that's absurd to me. People, when people go in who aren't normally attracted to classical music, to that sort of thing, they don't think, oh, maybe classical music is cool. They think, ha, I knew it. It's just basically pop music too, and it's all kind of one and the, one the same thing or whatever. And like, as you say, what it takes is people in ch- who wield power to say, no, you're wrong, and here's, we, I, we have the authority to uh, promote the great art or whatever. I hope it's true in the church. You know, I hope that there's a big change. We all, of course, have, have church jobs and uh, you know, sing and exercise influence there where we can. Uh, the Miranda Ensemble sings Compline every, almost every Thursday night during the church year, and uh, it's you know, it's growing in popularity. So along the lines of the Minnesota Orchestra, and there's clergy people who are like, maybe people actually want something substantive that's maybe not just affirming everything they already think, you know, something that challenges them. And the, the 
great music uh, of Western you know, civilization, choral music especially, of course, as, as it so happens, is almost exclusively Christian in, in theme, um, is so ideally suited to that purpose. If they could rediscover that, that great alliance between uh, the sacred and art, that'd be fantastic and, and that would be really wonderful. Also, Roger Scruton is, is on the reading list, uh, an aesthetician who argues sort of these, these same things. He says, he, he's addressing our postmodern condition. How can we believe anything? How can we really be for something when we are so aware of all the limitations and, and so on and so forth? And he, he's saying, well, you know, as a matter of fact, just he, he himself, I think, is a believer, but he says, you know, uh, people just don't, can't really believe in anything full on these days. There's always some doubling back, and that includes the church. So what are we, what are we going to do if, if people don't believe? And his, his answer, which I'm very sympathetic to, is high culture, like art, has to take the place. We have to treat art with the same level of sacredness as, as we did and do the church. And if they both rise together, fine, great, you know, depending on your view on religion or whatever. Um, but, but there's no question that, that I think high art can definitely serve that purpose. It can, it, if, if somebody can't believe or whatever in religion, it's a great place to find meaning, to find uh, spiritual food, so to speak. Um, and that's why it really does irk me when I go to see things that are supposed to do that for me. And, and, and here I'm, of course, talking about choral music, and they just fail so miserably. Attempts to be popular, attempts to please, to represent a large group of cultures or, or something like that. Um, that, that really bothers me. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I agree with you. I, I really do hope that, uh, yeah, and I saw it before, wield power. Like, when, if you agree with me, if you, agree, if you don't agree with me, don't wield power and, <laughs> and submit. But if, if, if you can wield power and you agree with me, make, make changes that are unpopular, by all means. That's, that's what's required here. Um, it's, I'm afraid it's, it is a struggle and it's, it's a battle. That is where we're at today at, the, at our cultural level. Um, I'm really pessimistic again. I don't think we'll win at all. Uh, but do it anyway. Do it and, uh, and fight the good fight. So that's what I think. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes? Well, I'm also an elementary teacher and I, I um, experienced you know, just a, a little bit of that as well. I'm going into my second year of teaching elementary. Mm -hmm. um, and to, I thought of this when you were talking about the Minnesota Orchestra, um, and I agree. Um, at the same time, how do I get my fifth graders interested in an orchestra? Yeah. If I play them Ben Folds music yeah. played by an orchestra, maybe that's the hook. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, you know, taking the kids where they are right. and taking them where I want them to be right. is an important thing. And I mean, is that a, a step of desperation or, I mean, yeah. Well, the best we can do. And I think some, even though they might be silly and kind of resist at first, right. the second playing of it, yeah. they usually go, hmm. Yeah. So you gotta kind of be relentless. You kind of have to just do it again and again. That's right. I, I think, anyway, that's, sure. that's right. And you know, again, I don't think it hurts to emphasize that it's, unf it, it's unfair in a way that when somebody talks about what, you know, what we should be promoting in choral music, that like educators feel like they really need to like do that. They, they kind of don't. It should be the other way around. It should be educators are there to educate. And, you, and yes, I think you should promote the kind of things that I'm talking about in whatever way that you can. But you know, of course, it's a practical consideration. When I, how old are your kids? Oh, my kids, no. uh, <laughs> K through six. K through six, yeah. Um, I will tell you, I never started to enjoy uh, classical music until I felt like I was listening to it of my own power and like I wanted to check it out. I remember, I remember my elementary school teachers who I'm sure were, were saints and doing a great job and stuff like that, playing, playing a lot of, of orchestral music and stuff like that, and I didn't think I had any interest. I didn't, I didn't think it was, I, 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 maybe it's because I was rebellious by nature, but I just thought, nah, I'm not, I want to do, I want to get into what I think is cool or whatever. And it took a, it took a search that happened many years later. We're like, what kind of music do I think is even worth liking? And then I then I then I was like, oh, it's of course, this is perfect, you know. But for I would say I would say you 
you know, pure practicality, wage, just subconscious warfare to get them and their parents or whatever to think that this is um, to pr promote promote great art. And uh, now, of course, for little kids, it's just gonna there's gonna be tons of practice. Matters. What kind of things can they sing? What kind of things can they appreciate? And I have, I think that's a fine idea to play Ben Folds with an orchestra or something like that with little kids. I think that's just fine. It shouldn't it shouldn't be labor for them. It shouldn't be you know, suffering for them. And it shouldn't be suffering for you either. So practical measures, but always you know maybe if you can open the doors, that's uh, that's great. Yeah, of course, because the problem that that we have uh, in, 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 in any art has is not from like teachers teaching kids. It's from intellectuals who are like our age who are saying, no, but let's, it's Mozart is the same thing as this um, Miley Cyrus or whatever. I don't know who would make that argument, but you know, you know, I believe it, believe it. I mean, I, I went over some examples here of the type of thing, and I and I know I know a lot of the types of artists that we looked at today, and they absolutely say that. If this is not something I'm making up, um, and for people who are in charge of universities and people who are in charge of major cultural institutions like Minnesota Orchestra or something like that, they are absolutely anti everything that I've, that I've said here, and and de devote their lives and efforts to promoting the kind of things that I'm, <laughs> that I'm saying we should be against. So the problem is never, it's never like elementary school teachers teaching their kids pop or whatever. That, the kids get that anyway. I mean, that's, that's a thorough part of the culture. I think any little bit that you can even do to get them to maybe be interested is awesome. So, anything else? This is, this is the Miranda Law Ensemble, by the way. That's Ben, Andy, Andrew, and Nick. Yeah, so we're, we're doing Dowlin tonight. A few things that, just practical things that with, with the Miranda Ensemble. Um, we typically do, of course, very, um, I don't know what you'd say, someone called it academic programming. <laughs> but of course, as you might imagine, we tend to favor um, a certain time period and a certain aesthetic, namely the Renaissance uh, aesthetic above all others for vocal music. Uh, tonight, we're, we're delighted to be doing a whole, an entire Dowling show. So we basically are, are um, I mean, I was, was going to Core Music Con tonight and really got sick of this mixtape type affair where it's, oh, let's, a, let's have a little bit, let's have some arrangements, then let's have some folk music, then let's have some Western music or whatever. And I was like, ah, I just want, I want to sink my teeth into something artistic. I want you to give me something, you know? And so that's, that obviously plays into what we do now that, now that I have the group, so to speak. Um, and then we do other things we don't, I, I typically really like to avoid talking because so many concerts these days, even at the highest level of culture, whatever, everything needs an explanation. If you, can't, if you don't have a joke about the composer, forget it, the composer, audience isn't going to be interested in or something like that, which I think is absurd. We, we want a temple-like atmosphere in a way because I, like Roger Scruton, I think we should raise barriers around the, our artistic institutions. 